Hi, everybody. Welcome. So glad to have you here. Um, so uh, before we get started, just a little bit of logistics. I'm going to be flipping back and forth between uh, my course uh, to show you some different things as well as the slideshow. Um, and this is my mistake. Oh, my camera's not on. So you can see who I am. Hi there. Here I am. Uh, so um, you're going to get this slideshow. Uh, there's a couple links in it and, and that kind of thing. So uh, I will be sending that out after we're done here, as well as it will get posted with the recording of the webinar today uh, so that you know um, what we're doing. But I, I I'm going to leave it in this mode rather than uh, the slideshow mode so that I can go back and forth uh, to my class. Uh, so we are ready to get going. I've got Francis Choi here with me today. He's uh, my facilitator keeping the chat box uh, running and uh, helping with all of that. And um, I'm going to be the one talking. Uh, I'm Ann Blackman. I am the director of our e-learning centers here at Collin College, but I'm also an associate faculty in our education department. So talking about engagement and rigor as a discussed of, uh, you know, what, what are these 21st century skills and how do I do that but still keep my course rigorous? That is exactly what I um, I uh, am compelled to teach. I've got more than a full-time job, uh, but the reason I so enjoy teaching is, first of all, the subject, uh, learning frameworks. That is my passion. That was my study uh, with my graduate work, uh, but also because it allows me to inform my full-time job. How are we comparing face-to-face, -face, online, the different modalities of classes? So let's jump into it. So when we're talking about bringing in uh, rigor as well as engagement into the classes, um, one of uh, the buzzwords is that, um, that word um, 21st century skills. And uh, so it's not really too much of a new idea. Here's uh, attributed to Confucius. Uh, he who learns but does not think is lost. Uh, and uh, so that what we're talking about, what I like to think about in terms of that particular uh, phrase is many of us uh, went through our learning process where it was a lot of rote memorization. It was a lot of push information. And we managed to get through it uh, and do that. And it's a valid form of teaching, but it's not the only form of teaching. And also, when it is uh, the straight push, uh, lecture only, and rote memorization, there isn't necessarily a whole lot of thinking going on. So what do I mean when I'm talking about 21st century skills? Here are the uh, primary uh, items in, in terms of our uh, skills. Uh, the critical thinking, the creativity, collaboration, communication, technology and media literacy, and leadership. Now, these aren't just for students, are they? They're also for us. Uh, when it says 21st century skills employers want across industries, this is what we're expected of as educators as well. Uh, and then also making sure that our students have these skills within their classes. So here is, this is, this is the real um, focus. This is uh, from an article of why do 21st century skills still matter, uh, even though it's 2019. You know, that was all introduced a little bit more than 20 years ago. And uh, it is exactly the recognition that when we are focused solely on memorization and rote learning, that it's not preparing our students for what they're moving out into, not just in terms of workforce training, but to be an informed citizen, uh, to be um, uh, a responsible adult. So making sure that we're including all of that. So uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm skipping ahead <laughs> there. Uh, so what I'm proposing is uh, that all of us as educators need to also be learners. And, and we are. I mean, nobody sticks in this job for very long without uh, being a learner and being open uh, to new skill sets and new tools. And uh, that that metacognition, those 21st century skills, they are not just something for our students, but also for ourselves. Now, what I propose is that the more we are becoming metacognitive learners ourselves, being reflective uh, and being creative, thinking critically that we are able to do that along with our students. We can role model for our students. So let's bring back that word rigor. So, uh, so I have got a poll for everybody. Let me find that. Where is my poll? All right, I'm gonna launch the poll. So rigor. Rigor is a word that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I want to hear from you all um, what and how do you define rigor in an academic setting. I gave you some prompts here. Go ahead and choose any that are applicable uh, and also add into the chat box if you'd like to. Okay, I'm getting some good responses. Okay, so I've had 13 of the 18 reply. I'm gonna give you another five seconds to go ahead and put in your answers. All right, we're gonna end the polling. We're gonna share the results. Nobody took the bait uh, in terms of my uh, uh, off the cuff uh, sarcastic type answers. Uh, so nobody took that bait. Because truly, you know, it, it can be seen as a buzzword. I don't think of it as a um, status marker, although I have heard people say, uh, you know, that's that's just all that 21st century skill stuff. Eh, uh, doesn't really matter. All right. So it looks like we're pretty much in agreement uh, about what they are. I, I'm not surprised that the teaching student skills that are useful in school, the business world and life, that that got a little bit lower. Um, would anybody like to unmute themselves or write in the chat box any opinions on these items? Thanks, Andrew, I appreciate that. That rigor that uh, you equate that to degree of difficulty. I, I agree, uh, but, but to me, it's also very much the critical thinking aspect uh, is uh, what I propose as well. I think uh, traditionally uh, that when we're talking about just degree of di difficulty, how difficult can we make this? How tricky can we make these uh, test questions uh, that um, it's always got to go back to why, how does this serve the student learning outcomes? What What is the objective? Is it just to be a tricky question or is there a purpose in terms of what they're demonstrating? So making sure that doing both. I'm going to stop sharing those right now. So talking about engagement, this is where we're going to move on into, is uh, with engagement. And we're going to talk about rigor as we're talking about engagement. Uh, so um, what I'm going to do is go through a couple of different items, and then I'm going to use my course as an example for you so that you can see that. So in terms of engagement, you have to be a human being. Now, this is whether it is in an in-person class or an online class uh, that we are called, uh, and this is my opinion, uh, that we are called as the subject matter experts. That's why we were hired to be the professor, uh, that we have demonstrated uh, subject matter expertise. We have the credentials, but we're also a person because the fact is that we could just have a computer do this uh, if there was not uh, the importance of a human element to it. 
So what am I talking about in terms of establishing presence online? So some of those are uh, having that uh, pick on Canvas, an introduction video, uh, short video. So let me show you what I'm talking about. What I would also like is for anybody in terms of as I'm giving some examples, and these are just simply examples, I'd like you to also be sharing in the chat box because I'll be generating those and collecting those. So please go ahead and collect, um, add them to the chat box as well. Uh, and if there's something I'm showing that doesn't work for you, let me know so that we can have the conversation. Because again, there's not ever a one size fit all uh, for everybody. So establishing presence, what am I talking about? And, and this goes for both of our face-to-face -face classes as well as online, because we are all called to be using our Canvas uh, learning management system for all of our courses. The very first thing is making sure that you've got your face there so that as you uh, have got uh, that you're responding to students, you're making announcements, all of those different things, that it's got your picture there. There. Now, this is something I got uh, from Wendy Commons, uh, is the use of avatars using my Bitmoji. I, uh, and I know uh, anybody of that knows how much I like a good GIF or uh, a Bitmoji uh, will think I'm being disingenuous that I was a little hesitant about this in my class. Uh, and Wendy was the person uh, about a year and a half ago that said, no, 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 you need to uh, try that out, just use it uh, judiciously. It's a way to, again, just remind them that you're a real person, but it also provides that connection to them. So that's another way to be able to establish presence in different ways. Also, videos. I have uh, here in my modules, I've got a welcome video. I use pretty much the same welcome video. I'm getting ready to replace it this summer, but that's not something that I um, make new every semester. Uh, because it's 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 just of a this is who I am, uh, that kind of thing. So that um, I keep that one uh, the same. Uh, but uh, other videos I do, I do make an effort to provide videos uh, that are short and that are specific to this class. Uh, I challenge you to consider using videos. This is in particular for your online classes uh, that uh, to use your videos as a way to make announcements or to point out things that are going well or not going well that are specific to that class. These are not videos that are going to be on, you know, the best of list. Uh, they are not ones that for me that I keep or use because I'm talking about, uh, for instance, Friday, May 3rd, you know, so that I'm, I'm giving real time. But I, I use it very much like um, making announcements from the podium in a face-to-face -face class. If you'll add to the chat box, what are ways do you use videos in your courses? Uh, and um, if you're not using videos, are there any ways that you've been thinking about using them? I want to see some answers. Oh, you didn't know you were going to have to um, uh, actually participate, huh? Great. Video announcements. Oh, yes. Thank you, Kim. Uh, talking about videos for uh, feedback. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, this is a great opportunity that we have as instructors uh, for both face-to-face -face as well as online is within our assignments giving feedback. So I'm going to go to one of my assignments. And uh, one of the great things about the video feedback in assignments uh, is that you can do it on your phone. Uh, does everybody have the Canvas teacher app? 
It's a beautiful thing. It's available on iPhones as well as Androids. It's free. Uh, and I make sure that my students have got the Canvas student app uh, so that they do get my uh, announcements and things in real time. So I'm just going to pick uh, an assignment here. Oh, this isn't. All right. So right here with your comments, when you're giving a uh, assignment comments, you can write them in, but you can also right there, you can create a media comment. Now, if you're shy and you don't want to uh, have a video, you just want it to be audio, you can do that. It lets you choose just audio, but also video. Now, why? Why do a video? Because in a face-to-face -face class, you let those students see who you are. They they know for sure that you're a human being. Uh, so my suggestion is let your online classes know the same thing. That's establishing not only presence, but the relationship. I'm a human being that happens to know a lot about this subject, and I'm talking to you. Uh, so using those media comments. The other part here with assignment comments is uh, to also in terms of not just establishing presence, but establishing a relationship, this is the simplest thing that I was shocked how well it worked, is I always use their name when I'm giving them a comment. So this is Summer uh, in my sandbox class, and so that I always just start with Summer. And now, the fact is that a, a lot of my comments, I keep comments uh, and, and will cut and paste and use the same ones, I was shocked a couple years ago when I started doing this on a regular basis how my end of the semester evaluation from students went up telling me how they felt like the class was so personalized and that they felt like they knew me. I'm telling you, that semester, that is all I did, is started consistently putting their names in there. The other semester, when I got another little bump up in terms of students mentioning how they felt uh, connected, that they uh, uh, felt like uh, this was uh, a class that they knew the person, was when I did start to, as Kim had mentioned, do the media comments. That semester, I only did it one time, uh, but it stuck with them. So I'm not saying to change everything that you're doing, but just try mixing it up a little bit. And yes, Larry, Larry, Lori, huh, I'm sorry, Lori, uh, there that, yeah, you send them uh, to a YouTube link. You can do it either way. It is getting better here in Canvas. And I have to say that I have more success with the, just the short little, um, you know, a reminder, blah, 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 kind of a video within Canvas and doing it from my phone or my iPad. I, um, that seems to work better for me. Uh, but yes, I use use YouTube quite a bit for the others of how to do something, showing them my desktop, all of those things. So thank you, Lori, uh, for talking about that. So Courtney, this is a really good point. Courtney points out that um, always stutters on videos for feedback. Uh, so I'll do a voice to text version so I can go back and edit. That's great. But here is one thing I want to suggest to everybody. How do you talk when you're in class, in a face-to-face -face class? How, uh, what happens when you stutter? Or uh, like I just did of that, for some reason, I called uh, Lori Larry first. Uh, that it's not like you say, OK, wait, I'm going to erase that. You you know, you move on. Uh, and uh, that's what I'm suggesting of uh, really consider expanding the use of video as a form of that more personalized and more just-in-time type of communication. Again, when we go back to my uh, introduction video, no. I uh, just like Courtney is talking about. Yeah, that is one that's got a script uh, that I cleaned it up. This one right here. And I made sure that one was right because I use it over and over again. But when it is, hey, spring 2019 class, here's some things I want to remind you about. And it's very specific to that class. I let it go. 
uh, and and if I call Lori, Larry, I just say oops and I move on. Yes, thank you, Kim. Excellent point. She says, I think students like the human touch. Stuttering is okay. Uh, that yeah, I mean it's it's again of uh, as when you're in a face-to-face -face class. So oh, thank you. Some really good points there. All right, so let's go back to my slideshow. Trying to get it moved over. Here it comes. All right, so we already talked about this, creating a relationship, uh, using their names. Uh, I, this is something uh, that I've learned from other instructors of using names in announcements uh, that especially at the beginning of a semester that the first ones that are very bravely uh, getting started on an assignment, something like that, that so that I send out an, uh, an announcement that is reminding people this is something you need to do, but that I also say kudos, good for your, and I, I name the names, and uh, that uh, I give heaps of praise in announcements on a regular basis of, of making, I've, even when I've got a larger semester, I have a little tick box, I find something to say every single person gets a shout out in the announcements at some point. Always for positive things, never for negative. That's always on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, basis. One item with our new grade book that I really like is uh, the in the grade book, uh, the option of message all that. Is everybody familiar with this? I'm going to go back over to my class and I'm going to show you this. All right, so first of all, in settings, over at the feature options. So you've got all of these things that you can use anytime right here, new grade book. Turn that on. If you haven't, go do that today with your classes. Uh, first of all, uh, it's going to move over for everybody. This is a heads up that uh, here towards the end of May, the 1st of June, we are all moving as a college to the new grade book because Canvas is moving to the new grade book. Uh, but that uh, using that, so one of the great features of the new grade book that I like in grades is right here message students who and so that you've got all the different choices that if they haven't submitted uh that you can uh, do that if they haven't been graded if they scored less and you put in a number you know of what you want uh then this message goes to each individual student but that you didn't have to. So for instance, uh, these are my three students that haven't submitted this assignment yet. Uh, you don't have to go through and find them, that you're able to track them. Again, this is a way of not only encouraging them to be engaged, you're reminding them, hey, I can see that you're not participating, uh, but that you're also doing it personally to each person. I use these features in my face-to-face -face as well as online class. One of the big things that I've learned from my face-to-face -face classes, while it's, you know, super, you know, you can do a discussion in class and, and, and you've got excitement and you can monitor and see what everybody's doing, I have moved to going to at least one discussion online for um, even my face-to-face -face classes uh, and uh, for two reasons uh, that make sure that they're getting some uh, just mixing it up a little bit uh, and, and giving them some different ways to do things so they don't get too bored but that the other reason is because I consistently find that in my face-to-face -face class some individuals that are not the first ones to raise their hands, not the first ones to lead a group discussion in class will step up and be very vocal uh, in an online discussion. And so it's giving them, giving all of the students an opportunity to participate in some different ways. 
other things with discussions as far as uh, providing them different ways, different, uh, because really, whether it's in person or online, there's always going to be, um, uh, you know, it, no matter how great what you're doing, it gets a little boring. So another thing with uh, discussions that I try to do is at least a couple of different times that I offer that they can submit by doing a video, uh, that they can submit photos, and, and give them some different ways of discussing. I give them those as options. Uh, so I'm looking at the comments. So Lori says she'd like to use um, in the grade book the message uh, feature. Uh, love to use it as a reminder. Uh, but does it create too much of an opportunity for the students to ask to submit the late work? That's a good question, Lori. Uh, and um, you know, I'm one of those mean old teachers uh, that in my syllabus I state I do not accept late work, uh, and I refer students back to my syllabus on a regular basis. Now, of course, if there is a medical emergency, that kind of thing, that I will uh, extend um, a, a date for them. Uh, but one of the things that I always emphasize, again, this is in my syllabus, is that you have to tell me before the due date, not after. Uh, so yeah, it, it can if you're a person that allows late work, and that's again, that's always personal decision for each instructor. Thank you, Pamela. I appreciate your response. Pamela replies and says she doesn't think the messages from the grade book encourages late submission. I have not found that to be the case, and I've been using that feature for over a year. So thank you, Pamela. I appreciate that. So different ways of using discussions, uh, letting them do some different things. One item that I used, uh, I tried out, I'm going to go to the student view, uh, that I've just tried out with my class is Flipgrid. Uh, and this is a discussion app that's available in Canvas and uh, that you set it up as an assignment. Oh, it's doing that because I'm in the student view. Oh, sorry. And uh, so when the students click on it, it just automatically goes right to this page. And we can show you how to set that up. So it goes right there. So this is a tool in my full-time job I wanted to try out. But also as an instructor, it's like, OK, what are ways that I can keep students engaged? So I decided to try this out. But I tried it out as extra credit uh, because it might not work. And uh, so that that's where if I gave them the directions, watch my video, then click on the green plus, there's my video, uh, that when it's the student view, there is a great big green plus button right below my video. So my video and me and my cheesy little grin there uh, gives them the basic little instructions on how to do this. So this is something that's due tonight. Uh, and so, so far I've had three of the students that took advantage of this extra credit opportunity. And uh, because what I asked them was tell me, how long did it take you to figure it out? Did you use your phone or computer? And what do you think about stickers? Those, those were my questions. And so that this is the kind of thing that I recommend everybody to try out, uh, that when you're wanting to try something new, it doesn't have to be perfect before you try it with the students. If you make it as a learning opportunity for all of you and give them just a couple of points uh, to be able to work with you, it lets you know whether or not you want to actually incorporate it as a graded item. So this flip grid that I talk about, uh, where do you get those kind of things? That's down here also in settings. In addition to the feature options, which you can just turn on and off uh, and, and using them, I do use the external collaborations tool. That's another one that really uh, I use a lot in my class. But it's over here in apps. Now, there are quite a few apps that are already installed by the college. That's all the things that you have to clean up in your navigation, uh, because otherwise the students get totally confused with all the links that you're not using. But there are the other apps in here that you can just install to this one class. That's how I found Flipgrid. So it's right there. 
And uh, so I've already um, added it and uh, so that it adds in. So there you, you can see it. This is everything I have. I want you to see the difference uh, of here's everything that I'm using, but that for the students, what they see is a much smaller a curated list. Right, so how do you do that? While I'm showing you that, what I'd like you to do is write in the chat box, have you used the app section here in Canvas and what apps have you used? Uh, are there the, any ones in particular that you like and that you use? Yep, it's time to participate again. All right, so when you do add an app, it automatically goes into your navigation. What you want to remember is that you as the instructor have got access to all of these. They are in essence live for you, but it's only the ones that are up here that are going to be visible to the students. Obviously, I have assignments for my students, but that I don't have that available to the students because I make them go through modules or syllabus uh, are the two areas that I have them go through to be able to get to their assignments rather than just going straight into the assignments. Oh, Lori, tell us about NetTutor. How do you use that? And thank you, Kim, uh, for talking about Turnitin. Yes, uh, we've had Turnitin for years, but the great thing about Turnitin for the last year and a half is it's now integrated directly into assignments here in Canvas so that when you're creating an assignment, and I use this so much for all my classes, face-to-face, -face, online, everything is submitted directly into Canvas for a couple of different reasons. First of all, so that I can use Turnitin so that we can do the uh, checker. And so that is, nope. I do not have everything in here so I'm not it's not showing me so sorry this is not a good example we're gonna go away from that I'm sorry I, I didn't want to use my live class so that's why I push things here into my sandbox but it's not fully functional uh, but turn it in I don't care what subject you teach uh, that you probably have some sort of writing that you require of your students. I hope you do. Uh, and that the more that we are all using Turnitin, the more that we are collecting a repository. I had last semester a student that I, I oh, this still, you see, it gets me to uh, stop speaking in complete sentences. It was just, and I don't know why I'm shocked by these things. It was a one page reflection. Uh, that we were talking about a particular learning theory and it was give me an example from your life how this applies one page and we're talking about share a personal experience this person took another person's reflection and personal experience and submitted it as their own uh, caught it with turn it in right here in uh, Canvas. It was like 80% uh, direct match to the other assignment. The reason that was caught is because I'd been using turn it in and it was collecting and keeping those assignments. Uh, great, Lori, thank you. Yes, uh, submit, submit, she submits, has students submit essays for feedback, uh, and um, uh, particularly because her course uh, that they need help with MLA. Thank you very much. Okay, so Dee Stroman uh, is asking, how do you get your recent announcements to show up on your page? That's again down in settings uh, about where you want things. So it's down in the settings. Here in the course details, it's down here. Uh, and so that that's something that a call to the ELC, that they can walk you through that over the phone, uh, or always going over here to the help button and uh, searching the Canvas guides, uh, that it's there. But yep, that that's what allows you. And I like to have the three most current ones, oh, that's not the right place, uh, to be up there. 
Oh, thank you, Pamela. Click settings and then go down to more options. It's a box. Just remember that with settings, you always have to scroll all the way to the bottom and save. So we talked about discussions. Any other comments or questions about those? All right. So any one of these topics that we're talking about could be a uh, in-depth uh, discussion uh, and uh, that anytime you want to have this kind of a discussion, this is what we're here for. Your instructional designers and instructional technologists are available to every single faculty, uh, to the staff, and uh, that this is what our subject matter expertise is, is exactly this, of how do I make sure that the rigor in my classes are consistent, even though I have to teach them in slightly different ways. For instance, uh, and I'm not talking about just strictly online versus face-to-face, -face. what about your traditional Monday-Wednesday class uh, and then your weekend express class. If your primary mode of instruction is lecture, that might work for an hour and 15 minutes, that your voice will last and the students can stay engaged for an hour and 15 minutes twice a week for 16 weeks. But if you've got a weekend express class where you're teaching all of that same material in a three weekend time frame, your voice, I mean, even if somehow you were able to keep the student's attention by primarily lecture, your voice wouldn't last. So again, it's how do I make sure that we are getting across the same information but in a different way? So this is not necessarily face-to-face -face and online courses. It's always about the different modalities. Online is one modality, express, uh, the traditional 16 weeks. We have a lot of different modalities that we teach in. So again, when we're talking about not just engagement, but also rigor, uh, that as I showed you with Canvas, that again, that what we really focus on with instructors is making sure that your outline of your course is simple and deep. That's where I showed you of where I've got all those links and all that fun stuff, but I keep a very short curated list of links for my students. I push them through the modules. Uh, and, and that's where of remembering learning activities need to be equitable, but not exactly the same. I'd like to know from all of you, what are some ways that you have made some changes from a traditional 16-week course to a Weekend Express or a Maymaster? How have you made some changes to an online? What, what are some uh, different ways that you take things and, and make them slightly different? While you're uh, doing that, I'm going to then talk about formative assessments. We have the end of the semester evaluation by the students. They all get that popped up at the beginning of Canvas. There's not a whole lot that you have to do about that. But I also, let me see, I'm scrolling down to find it. Sorry if I'm giving anybody uh, that I give two assignments throughout the semester, which I refer to as checking in. Here they are. So the first one is generally in the first two to three weeks. Uh, there's, there's my prompt uh, that I tell them they can uh, type their questions or they can give me an audio or video, however they want to do it. And here's the questions that I ask them. What was something from class that was new to you and or made you think deeply? I, it's amazing of what I get from the students. Every semester I get something new uh, in, in terms of what, what they're using. What is something that's confusing or you don't understand? Sometimes this is the simplest thing of, I don't know how to use my app, uh, you know, and, and I am like, great, here, not great, but of, you know, uh, easy solution, contact uh, the ELC and our students stand ready to help uh, other students in learning how to navigate. Other things are much bigger and I don't know that this is the right class for me, uh, but giving them that opportunity to ask. 
flipping the class has been suggested as ways of uh, modifying. And what else? Oh, thank you. This is very rich feedback. So uh, Mike McConaughey uh, says that for May Master, he approaches it as two 75-minute periods and one 55-minute period with two breaks. That's a great idea, Mike, is, is to very be specific in uh, how you're pacing yourself as well as the students. Uh, and he does incorporate movies and more group and interactive techniques. Uh, that, uh, and, and we're going to do something fun each day. I, I really like that, Mike. Great, great ideas. Uh, oh, here, this is great from our culinary arts, replacing many of the traditional chef demos with technique videos uh, so that they are, um, their responsibility, this is somewhat of a, f a flipped uh, in terms of making sure that they've uh, looked at those before they come in to do the same ones. Uh, oh, okay, uh, back to question one. There you go, Mike. And how about what I can do is I'll make sure that I include these four questions in my email to all of you when we're done here. So I'll give you all four of them. Uh, but they're four short, open-ended questions and uh, collecting from the students. I do try on my checking in number two, which is right after the midterm exam. That's when, if at no other time that I give them a video reply, that's when I give them the video reply. I turn my video camera on, I read their answers, and then I truly just look into the camera and say, Hi, Mike, thanks for your feedback. And I just say two or three sentences, nothing deep, nothing going on, but of addressing if they ask questions, I answer them right there. I, if they're struggling with something, I offer what we can do in terms of next steps, keep it to a minute to two minutes, and then move on to the next one. Uh, for me, I tend to do those sitting out on my patio uh, at home with, with a beverage and uh, just simply um, use my iPad as the way to record, record, record. Uh, it, it really just pays dividends uh, for me uh, as well as the students. Uh, no, yeah, Mike, there you go. What kind of beverage? Thank you, sir, uh, that it is always sparkling water. All right, I'm, I'm having an issue with my PowerPoint. You've probably seen enough of it. Uh, that um, to wrap up things, I have got a couple of links that I'll be providing to you in the email of podcasts that I listen to. If you've got some podcasts, again, put them in the comments section and um, let me know uh, what podcasts that you listen to to help give you ideas uh, for being creative, helping your students be creative and being uh, better critical thinkers, how to engage. So I have um, uh, a couple of podcasts that I listen to regularly, The Cult of Pedagogy, The E-Learning Coach, Professor Game, and Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee. Uh, those are four of the ones that I rotate between in terms of podcasts. So if you have any ideas, please add them to the chat box because I will add them. I'll look up the link and I'll include that for everybody else. So I will get that sent to you all. Also, I encourage you to connect with me online. Uh, I have a uh, hesitantly opened up some of my YouTube videos to be to the public. I have always kept them uh, just listed uh, for my students that that they're not searchable that so that I just embed them into uh, my courses but it's been uh, suggested to me that using them as an example for other faculty. So um, I am providing you, uh, and, and will get you that as well, the link to uh, my YouTube. Pinterest is a place where I keep 
um, a board uh, that gives me ideas. That's been a great place for me to curate ideas that are not video based, but that are PDFs or links to articles and things. So I'm giving you that as well. And then finally, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, of course, I'm always here at the college and, and you can track me down uh, at any time, always available uh, to make an appointment and talk more about ed tech kind of things, but also connect with me, please, on LinkedIn. That's where I really have established a personal learning network of uh, other uh, subject matter experts in education, in learning theory, uh, and uh, educational technology. So join me there in LinkedIn. The most important thing is, again, remember that we're available here at the ELC for you, one-on-one, -on -one group sessions. If there's any of these webinars that we've done the last few weeks, if it's something that you'd like us to do, a face-to-face -face workshop, if you uh, want us to come to a department meeting or to a committee meeting, let us know. We're there to partner with you and work together, not just in designing your courses and making sure uh, that you're learning uh, as an instructor, but also working with our committees and the different groups within the college. So let us know how we can help. Francis has added the link to the evaluation for uh, today's webinar. Uh, if you've done an evaluation of our other webinars, you're able to do it more than once. So that I very much would like your feedback uh, to let us know how today went. Did it meet your expectations? Uh, did you get any new ideas? And most importantly for us, what are your suggestions in terms of future webinars and workshops? So I'm going to stay on for a couple more minutes. If there's any questions, go ahead, feel free to unmute yourself or uh, send me a message in the chat box. Uh, please make sure you're clicking on that link in the chat box uh, and uh, go ahead and uh, use the evaluation tool. Uh, we look for your feedback. Thanks for being here.